everybody. Welcome to another live stream for the History Ride podcast. Today, I'm joined by Professor Dale Martin. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you. Awesome. And welcome to the podcast. And for those that don't know him, Dale B. Martin specializes in New Testament and Christian origins, including attention to social and cultural history of the Greco-Roman world. Before joining the Yale faculty in 1999, he taught at Rhodes College and Duke University. His books include Slavery as Salvation, The Metaphor of Slavery in Pauline Christianity, The Corinthian Body, Inventing Superstition, From the, Hippocrate uh, the Hippocratics to the Christians, and The Single Savior, Gender and Sexuality and Biblical Interpretation, Pedagogy of the Bible, An Analysis and Proposal of New Testament History and Literature, and most recently, Biblical Truths, the Meaning of Scripture in the 21st Century. He has edited several books, including with Patricia Cox Miller, The Cultural Turn in Late Ancient Studies, Gender, Asceticism, and Historiography. He was an associate editor for the revision and, and expansion of the Encyclopedia of Religion, published in 2005. He has published several articles on topics related to the ancient family, gender, and sexuality in the ancient world, and ideology of modern biblical scholarship, including titles such as Contradictions of Masculinity, Ascetic Inseminators, and Menstruating Men in Greco-Roman Culture. He currently is working on issues in biblical interpretation, social history, and religion in the Greco-Roman world, and sexual ethics. He has, ha um, he has held fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Germany, the Lilly Foundation, the Fulbright Commission, USA, Denmark, and the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning in Theology and Religion. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, elected in 2009. So Dr. Martin, there's a lot of people out there that are, that basically say that how do we use um, methodology to tell anything that is true in the New Testament? Some people say that the entire New Testament is fiction and that nobody in there is real. Um, and, and that seems to be a popular belief online. And I know that most uh, pretty much that scholars don't think like that. Um, but there might be one or two that uh, seem to lean, lean towards that direction. What proper methodology should people employ to understand the history of the New Testament? Well, perhaps a little bit of history would do here. Before the uh, 19th century, uh, most people, which means most Christians, because they were the ones who were using the New Testament, just um, interpreted the Bible as if it was God speaking directly to them. Uh, they didn't even think it was very important who wrote the different books. It just was God speaking. So they could just, they felt they could just open up the Bible and read it out loud and it would be God's word. That was of course problematic in some ways because it would seem to say things that they didn't believe. Um, and it didn't say things they did believe. For example, they, it was hard to find direct references to the Trinity in the New Testament. So people would just, they would say, well, sometimes you have to interpret the Bible spiritually and not literally. Those were the terms that they used, literally and spiritually. Literally meant just as you would read any document, but spiritually meant that there could be other kinds of meaning in it that exceeded the literal sense. In the 19th century, and then really in the 20th century, we had developed what we have called, come to call historical criticism, which was the idea that you have to get back, you have to read the Bible just like you would read any other human document. And you had to get back to what, what the original authors uh, tried to say and mean. Now, that, of course, meant that you had to find out who the original authors were. And if you couldn't find out, you had to guess. And most of the time, we don't know who the original authors are, were to a lot of the Bible. And that includes the Old Testament and the New Testament. So scholars spent careers and careers and careers trying to do historical research to establish um, who wrote the book of Isaiah and when was it write, written? Uh, and then that came in, well, who wrote the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what we call the Pentateuch or the Jews call the Torah. And when was that written? Traditionally, that had been said that it was Moses. But in the 19th century, those ideas began to be questioned and histor historians started looking for human authors who could be attributed 
the authorship of the different books. So in the New Testament, that developed first in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And scholars started debating whether Matthew really was written by the disciple of Jesus named Matthew, whether Mark really was written by the companion of Paul named John Mark, whether Luke really was written by the companion of Paul named Luke, and whether John really was written by the, the, the apostle of John, uh, who was the brother of James and a, an apostle of Jesus. And scholars in the 19th century generally, and the early 20th century generally, came to believe that no, they were not written by those people for a variety of reasons, mostly linguistic reasons. These books were written in very fine Greek. They're not literary Greek by any stretch of the imagination, but they're not illiterate Greek either. And scholars began to question whether uh, illiterate fishermen or illiterate leather workers, such as some of these people were, could have written the kind of Greek that we find in the New Testament. And they came to believe, no, they weren't. Uh, that developed in the historical critical uh, idea that we actually don't know who wrote most of the books in the Bible, um, including many of the books in the New Testament. Um, and But the idea was you figure out what the original author, whoever it was, would have intended to mean and then you use that as the meaning of the text, the only meaning of the text, the meaning of the text that has the right to rule all other interpretations of the text. Now, in the 20, late 20th century and early 21st century, that is the years of my career, I started publishing in 1990 um, after I finished graduate school. And uh, you have developed what's called postmodernism. And this is the idea that the meaning of a text is variable. It has lots of different meanings. And uh, we shouldn't try to elevate just the historical meaning, that is what an imagined historical author would have intended to say, over all other meanings. That we can have other meanings of a text, such as the spiritual meaning, uh, or an allegorical meaning, or other kinds of meaning. Not to exclude the historical critical meaning, but to include other uh, approaches. In fact, it's called postmodern because it takes on the uh, qualities of modernism, that is historical criticism, but it goes back and it adds in um, ideas from pre-modern interpretation, such as medieval theology or medieval interpretation or allegorical interpretation or spiritual interpretation. So postmodern interpretation, which is kind of the place where a lot of scholars are right now, although, although not necessarily a whole lot of Christians, is the idea that there's not one meaning of the text. There are different meanings, and it's according to how you read the text that provides the text its meaning. In fact, I practice uh, a method called uh, reader response criticism. That's the idea that the text has no meaning. It's just an inanimate object until some reader actually reads it. And the meaning of the text ends up being whatever readers uh, believe the meaning of the text is, whatever the readers take to be the meaning of the text. Now, that bothers some people because they think that just opens up to everything to everything. But it doesn't necessarily because all readers are also influenced by communities. So it comes to be that um, the meaning of a text often uh, resides in a socially agreed meaning of the text. So the meaning of the text for your church may be somewhat different from the meaning of the text for a historical scholar or the meaning of the text for a medieval monk. But the meaning of the text that your church uses may be a legitimate reading of the text. So that's a little historical introduction to uh, where we are now. The short answer to your question is the meaning of the text is always going to be debatable and it's always going to shift. When you look at Paul's letters, um, there are some that will say, well, Paul doesn't really describe Jesus. His Jesus is vague. Um, yeah, he has some references to a crucifixion, but the gospel story is missing from the text. Do you think Paul knew, knew more about Jesus like the gospels did, but he just doesn't elaborate on them because they're letters and we wouldn't expect him to do so? 
I think he does know some more than what we get straight from his letters. And I have to explain that most of us critical scholars believe that there are only seven letters in the New Testament that were actually written by the Apostle Paul. And, but there are 12 or 13 that bear his name in some way or have people have claimed to be by him. Uh, those seven letters are Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st um, Thessalonians, and Philemon. The others, such as Ephesians and Colossians, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, and others, um, we believe were written by followers of Paul sometime after his death, although they were published in his name, and they circulated in his name. Uh, but we, and the scholars have come to this by just looking at, again, the language, the vocabulary. Um, the seven letters we believe were actually by ta Paul are all remarkably consistent in their use of Greek and the terminology they, they use for uh, theology and things like that. They're also fairly consistent, although Paul was never totally consistent, but they're fairly consistent in his theology and worldview. But if you just take the seven letters of Paul uh, as being what Paul actually knew in his lifetime, we do have him quoting sayings of Jesus in places. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, he quotes, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, he quotes Jesus as a founding the Last Supper. And he quotes it not very different from what you find in the Gospel of Mark. Now, did Paul know the Gospel of Mark? No, because the Gospel of Mark was written in 70, and Paul was writing around the year 50. So there's no way Paul could have known the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Matthew or Luke or John. Paul was the first writings we have, and yet he quotes several sayings of Jesus uh, that show that he knew traditions about Jesus. And he may have even known some written uh, records about Jesus, but not the Gospels as we currently have them. So it may be that he only quotes, he, he seems to have very little interest in the earthly life of Jesus. Um, he, it just, uh, he sees Jesus as this uh, cosmic, heavenly sent savior figure who was sent by God to save the whole cosmos, the world, um, this earth and any other worlds there are, if there are any others. And Jesus came as a pre-existent divine being uh, into the world, lived his life, was crucified, buried, and raised, and then went back out of the world. And that's and that crucifixion for and resurrection for Paul is the central uh, salvific event. We say, theologians, we say soteriological. That just means salvation. And so Paul's more interested in the one event of Jesus as Savior than he is in any of the daily life of Jesus. So it's, it's definitely true that Paul just didn't seem to think that, it, that a lot of the things that the Gospels say about Jesus were necessarily important. But that doesn't mean he didn't know them uh, or doesn't know about them. But it's certain he doesn't know the Gospels because it would be anachronistic for him to have known the Gospels. Do you think that when Paul quotes the Eucharistic sayings of Jesus and the, and the Last Supper stuff, do you think that Jesus could have said those things? Yes. Um, I don't think... I've also taught courses on the historical Jesus, and those are courses where you try to take the Gospels and Paul and anything else you can find, such as the Gospel of Thomas, which I think is a, a useful resource to get sayings of Jesus that may go back to the historical Jesus. You take those things and you try to figure out what can we say with any degree of confidence or any a, media, a modicum of confidence uh, confidence about whether this goes back to the historical Jesus of Nazareth. And I think there are some things we can do. This is why I don't think people who say Jesus never existed, um, there are very few scholars who say that. In fact, I know of no uh, biblical scholar that I know of who I consider a reputable, well-educated biblical scholar who argues that. There are guys with PhDs, a few guys with PhDs who argue that, but I don't consider them reputable PhD in biblical scholarship. 
they their PhDs are in other fields. But um, I don't. I think that that's why there's just too much in the the Bible that doesn't quote it each other um, that says things about Jesus of Nazareth that there's no reason to doubt them. Um, so when I teach a course on the historical Jesus, I try to make a sketch and it is a sketch because we don't have a lot of nailed down things, but um, there is a sketch of things we can say about Jesus of Nazareth. And I think Jesus of Nazareth probably did have some kind of last meal with his disciples before he was arrested. I don't think it was intended to establish the Eucharist or the communion. That would come later. But it wasn't unusual for a master teacher to have a meal with his disciples and even a memorial meal with his disciples if he thought that he was going to die or be killed. And I think that that's entirely plausible. Um, now, you can't, uh, I think you have to take away anything out of those accounts that make it sound like the Eucharist. Um, but could the historical Jesus have said, have taken a piece of bread and said, this is my body. So when you eat this bread, think of me. Or this wine is my blood. So when you drink this wine, think of me. Um, that's not, that's not unusual or irrational or, you know, supernatural, or it's not particularly ecclesiastical or theological. So I think it's entirely possible that Jesus of Nazareth actually did say a lot of those words at some kind of meal with his disciples toward the end of his life. There are some that do believe in a historical Jesus, but question the, the history of Judas Iscariot that will say that uh, the, the Judas Iscariot story seems fictitious, but Paul talks about um, a betrayal of Jesus. What do you make of that? I have tended to take the historical existence of Judas as historical simply because, okay, one of the tests that we use to try to weed out material from the Bible that we think is not historical from material in the Bible we think is historical is we say, how likely is it that early Christian, faithful Christians, people of faith, how likely is it that they would invent this story? And I don't think it's likely they would have invented um, a stories about one of the 12. I do believe that Jesus appointed 12, especially uh, inner, an inner circle of disciples. They came, they came to be called the apostles, but originally they were just followers of Jesus. And I think Jesus chose 12 of them because that's in all the different sources. It's even in Paul. Um, and uh, we don't know their names because in different gospels, sometimes their names are not exactly alike. I think Peter, James, and John certainly were historical, and they were the central ones because they're in all the sources. But there are other names that kind of vary if you look at Matthew or Luke or different uh, gospels or things like that. But um, I think that Paul, that Jesus did choose 12 people, 12 men. And I think it's important that they probably were all men. Although I do believe Mary Magdalene was a very, very close disciple of Jesus. And that's historical too. Um, and there again, I don't think later followers would have invented Mary of Magdalene. They, you know, they, there was not a lot of interest in promoting women at this time in uh, these circles, especially the more um, rural uh you know, circles that Jesus moved in. He was from a small village, uh, farm villages. That's where he worked. That's where he, you know, preached. It's where he performed his miracles. And I think he probably did perform some signs that people called miracles, uh, healing people and that sort of thing. So I don't think it's, in, it's plausible that the early Christians would create Mary Magdalene as a central carry. Uh, figure in the story of Jesus, even to the extent that she's the first person to see Jesus resurrected from the dead. And that's that's. I don't think that's what ancient guys, and there were men who wrote these documents, I don't think that's what ancient men would have invented. And in the same way, I don't think they would have invented a, an, a very close disciple of Jesus uh, who betrayed him to the Romans. Do you think that Paul could have known the Q document? The what document? 
the Q document? No. Uh, I don't think he knew them because uh, those documents, uh, well, the Q document, um, Paul never quotes anything that I think we with any confidence can say looks more like Q than it does anything in the Gospels. But it's not too surprising. Um, I think the Q document was not known to very many people at all. It was obviously known to Mark and Matthew. I don't think Luke knew about it. I don't think John knew about it. Um, the only way we have, and remember Q is a hypothetical document. It's a document that scholars have said, how do we make sense of the passages in Mark and Matthew that look verbatim with each, I mean, Matthew and Luke, Matthew and Luke, not Mark, Matthew and Luke, that look verbatim in Matthew and Luke, but that, that neither of them got from Mark. We know that Matthew and Luke both used Mark, but Matthew and Luke also have completely verbatim agreements on sayings that they don't find in Mark or that we, we can't see that they found in Mark. And so scholars just basically invented as a hypothetical document, Q. Uh, it was a German invention, uh, and that's why we call it Q. It comes from the German word Kvel, which just means source. So we don't even—it doesn't even have a name. We just call it the source. And um, uh, I think that Q is a good hypothesis, but it's only a hypothesis, and we have to always remind ourselves that it's only a hypothesis. We don't even know whether an actual document like that existed. I personally think it's a good hypothesis to use to explain where Matthew and Luke agree, not just on some theme, but verbatim in a saying of Jesus, <clears throat> but they didn't get it from Mark. <clears throat> Do you think that the document existed or are you kind of agnostic on the issue? I'm kind of agnostic. I think it's a good hypothesis. Um, but not every historical hypothesis needs to be affirmed as a historical fact. When Paul argues with other people, like in 1 Corinthians, he says, oh, he complains that you follow Kephas, you follow Paul, or you follow um, Apollos, or this guy, or that guy, or in Galatians, he seems to get upset at people disagreeing with him on his theological understanding of Jesus. What are these different communities that he's arguing with? Did they? Do you think they had... Do you think that they had vastly different views of Jesus from Paul? Because, for example, in Galatians, Paul says Jesus was born of a woman. He was portrayed as crucified among you. So there seems to be people, there seems to be people that believe the opposite of those things. Well, I think Paul was a pretty agonistic fellow, argumentative, let's say. And when he speaks of the followers, people who call themselves in the Corinthian church, I am of Peter, um, I am of Apollo. And he, in fact, he speaks, Paul speaks very well of both Peter and Apollo in other letters and in places. I think that if he, when he mentions them in that, in that Corinthians passage, I think if they held absolutely opposite ideas, like that Jesus was not at all divine, um, or that Jesus was not resurrected from the dead, I think he would have attacked them. I don't think he would have just said, you know, it's fine if you're a follower of Peter, but and people are followed by uh, Paul. But the way he talks about it is that he's just he's just saying you don't need us human leaders to line up behind. Just line up behind Christ. <coughs> and so I think. I think that if those groups, if Paul viewed those groups as being radically different from his own house churches, and remember, all of these groups lived in house churches. They, they, there was no established church. Um, there could have been several house churches in Corinth in the first century. That's where he's writing. And so I take it that there was a house church here or there that considered themselves ideally followers of Peter, followers of Peter, and others of Apollo, Apollos. Um, I, I think that if you think that 
they would have been radically different from Paul's ideas, he would we would see more tension uh, in Paul's writings against them. Now, when you get to Galatians, if you notice, Paul is very upset in Galatians that they have been led astray, he thinks, by people preaching what he considers a totally different gospel from his own. But he never names the leaders of that group. Uh, he just says some people have come in falsely calling themselves. He calls them the super apostles in Galatians, in 2 Corinthians. And, and uh, he, Paul's perfectly willing to attack other leaders of other groups of Christians. But when he does so, you know he's doing so. In Galatians 1 and 2, he's in 3, he is adamant in his opposition to the people who have come into Galatia uh, after he has and are trying to uh, win over his converts to their views. Um, and it's not hard to see what their views are. The main thing is they're telling Gentile believers, you can't be a true Christian unless you're circumcised. Um, because, of course, Jesus was Jewish and Jesus was an Israelite. Jesus was a son of Israel and we are an extension of Israel. Paul also never considered himself the founder of a new religion. He considered himself the extender of Israel to the nations or the Gentiles. The Gentiles is just the Greek word for the nations. And the Jews use that for everybody except Jews. Paul never considered himself founding a new religion. But when it came to the Galatian controversy, he said, if you go along with being circumcised, and he's saying this to Gentile believers in Christ that he has converted uh, to the movement, He's saying, you will fall from grace. You will be cut off from Christ. That's pretty radical. That shows that whatever this, uh, these other leaders were teaching in Galatia, Paul not only thought was different, he thought it was wrong, and he thought it was diametrically opposed to his gospel. You never hear Paul talk like that about Peter or Apollos. Do you think that there were quite a variety of different movements of Jesus with different views on Jesus in the first century leading up from Paul's letters to the Gospels? Yes. I think that the variety of, let's call them, movements of Jesus, it's kind of anachronistic to call them Christianity at the time because that really took centuries to develop. Um, we certainly in the second century have very, very different versions of Christianities. And I don't see any way we shouldn't expect that in the first century also. Now, we don't have a lot of record of that, but we do have hints of it in the Gospels or Paul's letters or Revelation, for example. The, the book of Revelation, the first five letters, the first seven letters that are in the book of Revelation show what look like really different kinds of versions of early Christianity that are different from Paul's. In fact, I think some of them preached against Paul. Paul was the target of their preaching. But, and they also preached that um, uh, you, had to, you had to reject any kind of the eating of meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Well, Paul's a bit wary of meat sacrificed to idols, but he teaches the Corinthians that as long as they do it in the proper way, it's not wrong to eat it. They can't worship the idols. And so they shouldn't eat the meat actually, you know, in a context of worship of that God or goddess, but it's not wrong for them to eat it in someone's private home. If someone comes in and say, you know, I, look, I got this great grill of beef at the market and I bought it from this stand that's operated by a guy who buys his meat from the temple of Apollo. Well, a temple of Apollo. Uh, Paul basically tells the Corinthians, don't worry about eating it. The meat, the god, which Paul believed was a demon. Paul believed Greek gods were actually demons. And a lot of Jews believed that if you ate meat that had been sacrificed to a god, a Greek god, you were, that demon could enter into your body and you could be um, 
inhabited by the demon. Paul seems to be teaching that, no, you don't need to worry about that. Um, but there clearly are Jews, uh, Christians in the book of Revelation, who believe that you are committing idolatry if you simply eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. So that represents a different kind of Christianity than represented by Paul. It also represents a kind of Christianity that probably became more the majority in the second century. Because in the second century, eating meat sacrificed to idols seems to have become a bigger problem in Christianity than it was for Paul. So we, that's the other thing about this. We can't take Paul as representing uh, all of Christianity in the first century. We can't even take him as representing the, the majority of Christianity in the second century, in the first century. Um, he's just representing one form of it. And because he's representing one form, it's historically sensitive to say there must have been other forms, and I would say many other forms. Do you think that Paul's teachings were similar to the teachings of the historical Jesus, or do you think they were drastically different? Well, let's say I think they are significantly different. Um, there are some ways that there's a great continuity, I think. I believe, for example, that um, Paul, I think Jesus taught that the most central aspect of the Jewish law were the first two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. That love, and especially love of neighbor, is the, the central, it's, that's the whole Jewish law wrapped up in one. Paul believed the same thing. In Romans, he, 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 Paul even leaves out, he quotes uh, Jesus' words about loving God and loving neighbor. And it, in two cases, he actually leaves out the love of God. He says, you know, this, the message of the law is the love of neighbor. That's the central thing. Um, everything else in the law is summed up in love of neighbor. Now, that's pretty remarkable. I don't think that meant that, Jesus, that Paul was rejecting the love of God. It's just that the love of neighbor um, became so important to Paul that he was willing to say that every other Jewish law was held within that law. And if you fulfill that law, you fulfill all of the law. And that's why I think he believed that the Gentiles could keep the law in a sense without having to be circumcised or without having to um, eat only kosher or those kinds of things. Now, I think that Paul is in complete agreement with Jesus on that. Um, there are other things about that. There are other sayings uh, that Paul says um, and other ideas that uh, I think he is in complete agreement with Jesus. So I would not say that he's diametrically opposed to the teachings of Jesus in any stretch. I would say it's somewhat different here and there because Paul's theology developed in a more, like I said, cosmic direction. He took the gospel to be more about our eternal salvation um, and our freedom from cosmic sin. And I don't think Jesus talked a lot about that. Um, but I think, for example, uh, Jesus... Uh, practiced, or at least his disciples practiced baptism, and I believe Jesus was baptized by, the, by John the Baptist. And Paul also supported baptism as the initial right to come into the church. Um, we already talked about the communion, the Eucharist. I believe they had that in common. Um, I think that both Jesus and Paul believed in the continuation of the Jewish law, the Torah, they, that, this makes them very different from some second century Christians like Marcion, who believe that we should just throw the Old Testament out, that the law was entirely was given by the devil or by a lesser God, an evil God. Paul would never have anything to do with that, and I don't think Jesus would have anything to do with that. So we can, we can point to continuities between uh, the historical Jesus and the historical Paul. But we can't find the elaborate cosmic theology that we do find in Paul. We can't find that in the historical Jesus. I think the historical Jesus saw himself as a Jewish apocalyptic prophet. He was here as a Jewish prophet to announce uh, the end of this world and the beginning of the next world, the, the kingdom of God. 
Paul also believed in the kingdom of God, but I think he believed uh, that um, Jesus's being was much more elaborate than that. I think he really did believe Jesus was divine in at least some sense. I don't think the historical Jesus believed he was divine in any sense, really, except, except insofar as all human beings are sons of, and daughters of God. He believed that, and Paul also believed that. But Paul believed Jesus was a very, very special cosmic being who was divine in a special sense and was here to redeem the entire cosmos. I don't think that's what the historical Jesus believed about himself. But that's a, what trying to figure out what Jesus, the historical Jesus, believed about himself is a notoriously difficult historical problem. Is there any way that one could try to figure out what Jesus thought about himself from the text that we have? I do, which is why I said uh, what, I, what I just said is I do believe we can figure out that Jesus thought he was a Jewish prophet who came like John the Baptist and other prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. But his he was also proclaiming the the sudden coming of the kingdom of God that would happen very, very soon, maybe even in his lifetime. I don't see that Jesus thought his death would have been, I think he maybe foresaw his death, but it was be as a, as a martyred Jewish prophet, uh, martyred because of what he taught um, by the authorities, but not killed because his death would be an atonement for the sins of the world. I don't think that ever entered uh, the mind of the historical Jesus. It was, it was just, I think it was just too bizarre a thought for a Jew of his time to believe. But by Paul's time, that thought had developed. And so that's the central aspect of Paul's theology about Jesus, that Jesus' death was an atonement. Um, I don't think Jesus thought his death was an atonement. And in fact, that explains one of the curious things about the Gospels. Jesus' death is portrayed in the Gospel of Mark as an atonement for death, for our sin. Uh, that is a way of atoning for the sins of humankind, like a sacrificed lamb. But now you look for that in the Gospel of Luke, and it's just not there. Um, it's there a little bit in the Gospel of Matthew, mainly because Matthew was influenced by Mark, I think, but it's not there in Matthew very much either. But it's not in the Gospel of Luke at all. So I don't think Jesus, I think that's pretty good historical evidence that the historical Jesus did not teach about his death, that it was an atoning death. But that's very central for Paul. When we get to the Gospels, do you think all four Gospels are engaging in, a, in, a, in an attempt to harmonize different points of view of Christianity, or we can't, or do you think we can't say that about all four of them? Do you think, or each one has a different agenda on its mind? I don't think they're trying to harmonize each other, because I don't think Mark, Mark didn't know anything about Matthew and Luke. I think Matthew and Luke knew Mark and they knew Q, but I don't think either of them knew each other. So the, and I think John, the, the question of John is highly controversial because we used to teach that John knew none of the other three gospels and that he was totally independent. But now scholars are beginning to start to see some similarities between John and especially Mark and maybe also a bit of Matthew and Luke. So some people are willing to say that John, John doesn't quote Matthew, Mark, or Luke, but we are willing to say maybe he had read them, maybe he knew them. That's controversial. Um, but I, I think that the, most, the, the greatest revolution we had in the 19th and 20th century was uh, the urge of scholars to read each of the four Gospels on their own terms, as if they didn't know anything about the others. And that way we were able to trace out the differences, the different emphases. And, and that's why you can see that, okay, Mark is very heavy on the atonement, uh, the death of Jesus' as atonement. And then we see that Luke has none of that. In fact, he even scrapes out of his use of Mark any mention of the atonement. Because uh, I just don't think Luke believed that he believed Jesus' death was the the martyrology, the martyr, the martyr, martyrdom of a prophet, a true prophet, and so that's what Luke emphasizes. 
uh, Matthew also is very different because um, he his main emphasis, and I think in some ways, was to stress that the Jewish law will live forever, and all followers of Jesus are required to keep the Jewish law. Now they're they're required to keep the Jewish law according to Matthew according to Matthew's own interpretation of the Jewish law. So, example, whether you wash your hands before eating or the, whether you keep kosher in certain ways, Matthew will interpret those things differently from the other Gospels. But he has his own distinct voice and his own distinct theology. Um, so Matthew is different from all the other Gospels. Mark is different from all the other Gospels. Um, uh, Luke is very different from all the other Gospels, especially when you add on Acts, which the same author wrote and shows different interpretations of Jesus. And John is totally different. John, you know, if you, for example, exorcisms are very important in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are no exorcisms in the Gospel of John at all. Well, where did they all go? Well, whoever wrote the Gospel of John, I believe, just either didn't believe in exorcisms or just didn't want to stress them as part of his theology. Um, they're just not there. Um, and you have miracles all the way through the first three Gospels. We don't even have what are called miracles so much in John. We have what John calls signs, when Jesus changes the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Well, that seems almost less like a miracle than more like a symbol symbolic teaching of water to wine in the in the kingdom of God or something like that. Um, so. I think all we've been able to make such progress, I think, in modernist biblical scholarship precisely because we have rejected harmonizing them and we have tried to let each of them speak with their own voice. So much to the extent that some people think we've gone too far. They think we, for example, we said John was completely independent from the synoptic gospels, what we call the first three gospels. And we call them synoptic because that Greek word means they see through the same lens. Uh, in a sense, they look the same, but John is very different. Um, you know, his order is different. His style is different. Uh, Jesus speaks very um, briefly in the other gospels. And in John, Jesus gives these sermons that are a chapter long and they go on and on and they get into symbolism and, and theology and all this sort of thing. Well, that's, that's just not Jesus of the first three gospels. So uh, some people have said we've gone too far, though, and that we need to say John may have known the other three Gospels because there are some similarities. But I think we made progress in the modern world by insisting that first we take each of the four Gospels on their own and not try to harmonize them. And that means we don't look for harmonizations. And I would say the same thing about the Gospel of Thomas. Um, some people would say that the Gospel of Thomas is very late and it just used the other Gospels. And I don't agree with that. I think that there are sayings in the Gospel of Thomas that look like sayings in the other Gospels, but it's not enough like them to have copied them. Or, and maybe Tom, the author of the Gospel of Thomas, and it's not written by Thomas, by the way, like the other Gospels also aren't written by the people whose names they're in. I would say the Gospel of Thomas comes sometime from the early first, second century. So sometime after 100, maybe, or after 90, but before 150. And that still places them very early. Um, but it's very hard to say that the Gospel of Thomas quotes the other Gospels. So I, we also take the Gospel of Thomas as being different and not dependent on the other four Gospels. And I think that's the safest historical way to go. And by doing that, we've been able to establish these five different sources as five different sources. And I think that's been a, a great progress of modern historiography. Here's a different question, although very similar to one I just asked you. Um, originally, I wasn't trying to ask if the Gospels were trying to harmonize each other. It was, to be more specific, um, more like the, the Gospel sources. Are they trying to harmonize uh, different Christian Christianities? Or I know Christianity didn't exist by the term yet. Different Jesus movements, along with the Gospel sources like perhaps M and L. I don't see evidence they were trying to harmonize. Um, I think that also is a bit anachronistic. It assumes that these traditions were more for firmly established and were represented in texts, 
and specific communities. But I do think they were influenced by one another. So there was cross fertile. Let's let's use the word cross fertilization. Um, I think that's easier to defend than harmonizing. Um, so I would say, it, it, but of course we can't go behind the written gospels completely because we just don't have the sources. We everything we do is guesswork, and um, I do think that. Uh, different writers of these gospels and the people who, so I think all of the gospels used sources that were prior to them. Uh, in some cases, I think they were even written sources that were prior to them. I've already talked about Q as a source for Matthew and Luke and Mark as a source for Matthew and Luke. Um, but John, I think also had a written book of signs that he was using as a source, because he says this was the second sign that Jesus did after coming out of Nat, uh, Galilee. The, you know, he, he even numbers a few of the first signs. And I think that shows that he's using some kind of source in, in front of him, even a written source. I imagine, though, that what most of them are dealing with is what we would call oral traditions. You know, people sitting around a campfire somewhere, you know, uh, telling stories about Jesus. And these stories influence each other, which is why you can get um, uh, stories in the Gospels. Uh, what's the term I'm looking for? This the the parable of the sower. You get parables. Some parables are very similar to one another without being exactly the same. So, the parable of the sower. You have that in the Bible. But you also have a version of the parable of the sower in Thomas. And it has the same structure, but it's very different. And you can't tell from the language that Thomas was copying that from one of the canonical gospels. But so you have to say, okay, well, where did he get it? Well, he could have just gotten it from people telling it. Um, I grew up in a church where we didn't have a written liturgy. Um, Every, in fact, the church was kind of proud of the fact that whenever anybody got up in front of the church and prayed, they weren't reading a prayer. They weren't following a directed prayer. They were just praying out of their heart, off the top of their mind, and that kind of thing. Well, I could tell, though, when I was a little kid that the, these prayers sounded remarkably alike. You know, they used the same language. They used the same structure. And I knew there was no written place where these people in my church got these prayers. They just learned them by growing up among them. They just learned them by hearing other people pray this thing. And, you know, you grow up in a community and you start imitating the other people in that community. And I think that's where a lot of the uh, development of what came to be the Bible happened, is it happened through uh, oral tradition. I think you could take the same thing from uh, First Timothy, Titus, First and Second Timothy and Titus in the letters of Paul. Um, I do think that one person was the author of all three of those letters. And that one person, I think, did have uh, access to the letters of Paul. But those three letters have similarities that aren't necessarily verbatim similarities. So it wasn't like he was copying his own letter word for word all the time, although there are places where I think the writer of Second Timothy is actually, or no, Second Thessalonians, I think, which was not written by Paul in my view, was actually had First Thessalonians open in front of him, and that's why his wording sounds so similar to First Thessalonians uh, in the in part of Thessalon Second Thessalonians. But in the three letters to uh, Timothy and Titus that we have, you don't have word for word copying, but you have strong similarities, and I take it that those strong similarities come from oral tradition, not necessarily from written traditions. Do you think that the Gospel of Thomas could have known the Q document or something similar to it? That's really that's really a good question. And scholars line up on that side of the, on different sides of that question in ways. For one thing, I think it's very problematic because I keep trying to remind people we don't have the document of Q. It itself is a hypothetical document that we have reconstructed based on what Matthew shares with Luke verbatim or close to verbatim. So you're kind of, it's very, his, 
it's kind of bad historiography, I think, to try to make firm decisions based on completely hypothetical documents as far as textual borrowing. So is the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas definitely uh, does have some similarities to what we think Q was in, in some of the parables and that sort of thing. But to say that he knew the actual paper document of Q, to me, goes beyond the evidence. I'm just saying that if scholars want to write articles about that, that's fine. Let them do it. I'm not going to do it. Some make the argument, although I know not many do, but a few scholars make the argument that the Gospels were familiar with Thomas. What do you make of that? I don't think it's possible. Um, but that's because I don't... Some people place the Gospel of Thomas in the years, the 60s, and they think he's one of the very earliest of the Gospels written. I don't. Um, and partly it's because I believe that when you get to the Gospel of Thomas, you have evidence of forms of theology that I would not call Gnostic, but I would say are on the way to Gnosticism. And I don't believe that kind of Christianity developed until the second century. So I basically base my own dating of the Gospel of Thomas um, more on its theology than anything. And I just say, this looks like a later theology than an early theology. In other words, we, we kind of sometimes use the, the word primitive. And by primitive, we mean it must go back to the very beginnings of the Christian message. I don't think the kind of theology you get in um, uh, the Gospel of Thomas can be dated back to the 60s. I just don't think it existed back then. I don't think it was in philosophy back then. Um, you know, what we call Gnosticism was, I believe, a second century growth. And it didn't come into real flourishing until the third and fourth century, which is when we have, of course, the, the 350 is when we think the, uh, we date the, uh, you know, burial of the Nag Hammadi texts that I think it's safe to call those Gnostic, although that's also the beta among scholars. Some scholars don't want to say there's any such thing as, you know, a, a one general movement of Gnosticism in the ancient world. It's just, but I say, well, it's okay. We don't have to establish a Gnostic church somewhere. But I do believe there's a series of ideas that actually look like, the way I described it to students is it looks like somebody who is a platonic philosopher uh, is reading Plato's Timaeus about the, the world. And he's interpreting Genesis through Plato's Timaeus. I don't see that happening in the first century. Except with Philo, Philo the Jew, in the very beginning of the first century, but or he was contemporaneous with Paul. But I don't see Philo as uh, being, you know, the creator of what we later call Gnosticism. It has some similarities because Philo is very platonic. And uh, the, what I call the later Gnosticism is also very platonic. But I don't think Paul is platonic at all. I don't think any of the Gospels is platonic. The closest we come is the Gospel of John. And I think the things in him that look kind of platonic are just generally sort of general philosophical ideas that he has absorbed. We have a super chat question. From Shadman, thank you for your super chat. History Valley, my question to Dr. Dale, do you think Luke used uh, the hemp to the Aphrodite to craft his infancy narrative of Christ? I don't think there's any evidence of it, no. I couldn't rule it out, of course, but I don't think that the, I don't think that the evidence that some people have cited, uh, to me, hold up to critical scrutiny. What do you think about the idea that the Gospel of John was a redactional document that was written by many hands over time? Some scholars think that pieces of John were written in the middle of the first century, and it was finished until and it was finished in, in either the late first century or the early second century CE. I personally believe that there's no question uh, that the Gospel of John developed in stages. I think you can see it 
in the seams in the text. For example, if you read John 13 through 18, um, there's a farewell discourse of Jesus. And at first, Jesus says to his disciples, this is at the Last Supper in John, and he says, okay, we're done, let's leave. And it sounds like they're all getting up to leave. And then the next chapter, Jesus starts this long discourse that goes on for chapters. Well, now, why would Jesus kind of close down the evening and then start a long, uh, you know, speech again? That's one of those places where I think it's very hard to deny that someone took the text of what was before him and split it apart and stuck in something else and then put it all back together. So I think, uh, and it's also just the beginning of John, the first eight, 18 verses of John, the prologue of John, we call it. Um, it seems like it's added on. It, it's not, it doesn't flow naturally into the next section. Um, I think there are several places in the gospel, well, in the very last chapter of the gospel of John is obviously added because, you know, the, la the next to the last chapter of John ends and the writer even says, kind of acts like he's putting down his pen. And then you have more resurrection appearances of Jesus. And Jesus appearing by at the Lake of Galilee with his disciples. And it seems to me that the last chapter of John is clearly tacked on afterwards. So I do believe that the Gospel of John was uh, put together by uh, either an editor or some editors from different texts. And I tend to think that maybe it grew in stages all put together by one editor but he's he was using previously written texts and 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 previous stories so i think the idea that john is a composite gospel actually explains a lot about the scenes in the text that don't seem to fit very well when would you say that the Gospel of John was assembled by which date? Well, that's very debatable, and uh, I don't want to get in a fight with anybody about it. I tended to teach that it was sometime in the 90s, um, just because I don't, I found it hard to put him um, ahead of that, because the more I studied the Gospel of John, the more I believed that um, he had some knowledge of the other three Gospels, or at least some of the other three Gospels. I think it's much more certain we can put Mark at the year 70. And it's because of the way, the way he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. He predicts it as, he has Jesus predicted as happening very soon, but it hasn't happened yet. Well, if it was written after 70, then Jerusalem and the temple are already destroyed. And that's exactly what you get in Matthew and Luke. You see, Luke says, not only do you have the, the temple destroyed, but Jerusalem is trampled down and you have a time of the Gentiles. That seems clearly that Luke was written after the destruction of Jerusalem and maybe several years after. So I've tended to say, you have, in, you have indications of datable events in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. You don't really have that in John, but you do have uh, a more developed theology and a more developed Christology. For example, you have Jesus is coming out as pretty much equal to God the Father. And I don't think that Christology could develop very soon in early the early Christian movement. I think it took decades for Jesus to be seen as divine, and then even more time for him to be seen as divine in equality with the Father. So I say, I don't think before the 90s, and it even could be, a good bit after the 90s. I don't I don't really have a dog in that fight. I just when I have taught it in classes, I've just said I would place Mark at 70, Matthew and Luke in the 80s, let's say 85 just to be general, and John in the 90s or later. That's it. We have another super chat question. Shadman, thank you for another super chat. He asks, "Who do you think wrote Matthew?" No idea. Um, I don't think it was Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, the historical disciple of Jesus. 
uh, because his Greek is too Greek. Um, I don't think that a, a, a first generation disciple of Jesus would have the full kind of theology that Matthew shows. Um, and I, I think it's important that people realize that the four gospels we have in our Bible, they didn't have the names attached to them with any firmness until almost the end of the second century. I mean, we're talking close to 200. If Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew, it wouldn't have taken that long for his name to be attached to that text. And yet it did. Uh, same thing for Mark, Luke, Luke, and John. Some people have always said Matthew must have been written by a Jew, a Jewish Christian, a Jewish follower of Jesus, because he's so keen on obeying the law, the Torah. But I don't think that's discernible either. He, he is keen on the law, but you had a lot of Gentiles who were early followers of Jesus who really got uh, excited about the law also. Um, he, he also clearly shows at the end of his gospel that he expects uh, the church to be have a lot of Gentiles in it. He says, go out and convert the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, that also, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, I don't think that's the doctrine of the Trinity, but it's clo the closest we ever get in the New Testament to the do doctrine of the Trinity. And so I think it took longer for that to develop. So for several different reasons, I would say that the Gospel of Matthew was not written by the historical Matthew, but who it was written by, I think we're just making fools of ourselves if we try to assign names to them. Final question. Do you think that the, that the author of the Gospel of Luke knew Matthew as well as Mark? No. I know that's it's actually popular these days for people to try to get rid of the theory of Q by saying that Matthew either used Mark and Luke or Luke used Mark and Matthew. But when I read Matthew and Luke together, I think, you know, well, if Luke knew this passage, why wouldn't he include it in his own gospel? I would expect to see more inclusion of Matthean material in Luke if Luke actually knew the gospel of Matthew. And the same way for Matthew with Luke. Um, they both leave out too much stuff that they could each have strengthened their case with if they included it. Uh, and they don't. So I think that people who want to say that either Matthew knew Luke or Luke knew Matthew, they have the harder job in proving that because we just don't have, I don't think we have the evidence to demonstrate it. Um. Actually, I have one more question uh, now that you say that. What do you think about the three document hypothesis, which postulates, yes, Luke used Matthew and Mark, but we still need Q? Yeah, that's one. Um, I, there again, I say I don't see evidence that Luke used Matthew because I don't see quotations from Matthew and Luke, except for what people have called Q, and those are easily explained by Q. So if you have the hypothesis of Q, you don't need Luke's knowledge of Matthew. And then you also have the task of explaining, well, why did, if, if Matthew, if Luke knew Matthew, then why are his, the parables that they kind of share not the same? Why didn't Luke just copy the parable as Luke did with some of the parables of Mark? Um, we, we don't ever have a case of Luke just copying sections of Matthew. We have a super chat question. Let's take a look at that before we close for today. Stuart C., thank you for your super chat. When does Dr. Martin date Medidike, and does he see a literary relationship to any text in the New Testament? Uh, well, I'm beyond, I'm, I'm not an expert on the Didache. Uh, I think nowadays um, most scholars of the Didache are dating it to around the year 100, and I wouldn't disagree with that. Or maybe. 110 or 115. Uh, it does have a remarkable sophistication when it comes to liturgy that I tend to believe developed only slowly in the early churches. Um, but 
I think that the Didache shows very, very close connection to the Gospel of Matthew. <coughs> but since I think the Gospel of Matthew came from sometime in the 80s, I would attribute that to dependence of the Didache on Matthew rather than the dependence of Matthew on the Didache. But I would place the Didache in the beginning of the second century. Another super chat that got here just in time, so let's take a look at it. That's for thinking for your super chat. Could the Hebrew version of Matthew have been Q? I don't think there's any evidence for a Hebrew Hebrew version of Matthew. Uh, the only people who talked about a Hebrew version of Matthew in the ancient world were people who were writing much later, and they were trying to kind of defend the authenticity of Matthew as written by a Jew named Matthew. So they said, well, of course it's Greek. The Greek is really good, but that's because it's a translation. And the original Matthew was in Hebrew, but I don't see any evidence of it. And, you know, there are a few words here and there that like ruach or something like that, that are, um, you know, that in Matthew that come from Hebrew or Aramaic, they could just as easily come from Aramaic as Hebrew. But a Greek speaker could easily have picked up here and there um, a Hebrew word in the liturgy and therefore included. Um, I think most people who have studied the Greek of Matthew, and a lot of people have extensively studied the Greek of Matthew, almost all the scholars I respect, and I have not studied the Greek of Matthew with this in mind, but almost all the scholars I respect say there's just no evidence that this document was translated from Hebrew into Greek. It just looks too much like it was just written in Greek. The Greek is just flowing good Greek. And usually when you have a translation, you have some clues of the translation and there's just there are no clues in the tra in matthew to a translation except these very few words specific words but when it comes to the syntax the um you know the way the sentences are formed it's just greek there happens to be a couple more super chats shadman thank you for your super chat last question to dr dale do you think matthew's infancy narrative is historical do you think matthew's fulfillment citations are truthful uh the infancy narrative i think is not historical uh for one thing it directly is contradicted by luke's infancy narrative they don't have anything in common except that jesus was born in nazareth but how jesus family got to nazareth um, you know, what happened, what happened afterwards, were there angels, were there wise men, were there, you know, none of the details match, which I think means that both Matthew and Luke started off with simply the idea that Jesus was born in Nazareth. And I think, I mean, in Bethlehem. And I think, it, but how he got to Bethlehem from Nazareth is totally different. Um, Matthew just has Jesus' family from Bethlehem as if that's where they always were. Luke has them go from uh, Galilee to Egypt, then move back to Nazareth because of Herod. Um, so there's there's no confirmation uh, in Matthew for Luke or in Luke for Matthew. I think they both believe Jesus was born in Bethlehem because of later prophecies, but that's the only thing they have in common. Um, and the other thing is that I just don't see the the kind of stories you get in both infancy narratives are way too much like normal Greek infancy narratives. Uh, you know, there were stories like this about Plato. There were stories about this, like about, you know, all kinds of gods, you know, gods and sons of gods and great men, even great philosophers. They had birth narratives made about them. And so I think it just came to Matthew and Luke naturally to say, well, if we're going to have a book about Jesus' life, we've got to start off with a miraculous birth narrative, a real neat birth narrative. So they just created them or they heard them in uh, other you know, oral traditions. Um, what was the last part of that question? Let me pull it back up one moment. Do you think Matthew's fulfillment citations are truthful? Well, it's kind of what you mean by truthful. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are true Christians and interp in Christian interpretations of them. Do I think the historical Jesus actually said them? Uh, I, well, I'm thinking, no, I'm thinking you're, I'm thinking now the Sermon on the Mount where he says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. But if you mean things like um, when Matthew says, this was to fill the narrative, blah, 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 this was to fill the prophet. No, I don't think those are historical. I think that those are Matthew reading his Bible. They just sound like Matthew reading his Bible. 
to look at the super chat real quick. Dustin Ellery, thank you for your super chat. Dale was a joy to listen to. Thanks, Jacob. Well, thank you, Dustin, for your super chat. Hold on, that's another one. John Gear, thank you for your super chat. He says, Dr. Martin, for imparting your knowledge. Uh, thank you. I've learned much from you by watching your lecture series. You are a wealth of knowledge. Thanks. And thanks, John. And thank you, Dale, for joining me today. Okay, it's been a pleasure. And I thank everybody that super chatted. I really appreciate their support. really helps me continue this channel. And I thank everybody that participated in the live chat discourse. And I'll see all of you later. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.